Two summers ago, I downloaded the dating app Hinge. I'd heard from friends that it was one of the better platforms for LGBT folks to find dates, so being a lesbian, I decided to give it a go. I found it to be just as good as my friends had mentioned, as the little prompts really give you an idea of what people are like before you actually connect with them. I hate to sound like this horror story is sponsored by Hinge and Raid Shadow Legends or something, but it really was refreshing to find a dating app that seemed to focus much more on personality than just a person's looks. Anyway, I'm just flicking through profiles, sending out the odd message here and there when I come across the profile of a girl called Amy. Amy was hotter than hot. She was literally my type too. Crop dyed hair, sleeve tattoos, but a painfully adorable little face with these big, shining green eyes. On top of that, her job title said motorcycle mechanic, and there were legit photos of her working on old Harleys and whatnot, which, again, I thought was like the hottest thing ever. I double tapped the picture of her working on the bike, typed in a message like, this is so cool, and then just hoped and prayed that she'd be back in touch. It couldn't have been 20 minutes that passed before I got a little alert saying that Amy has invited you to start the conversation, or something like that. I'm thinking, no way. Is this a real profile? Sometimes a girl might take literally weeks to match with you, and here was Amy, hitting me up after less than an hour. I had my doubts, put it that way, but doubts that were quickly put to bed when she turned out to be charming, witty, and highly intelligent. We didn't always see eye to eye on certain issues, but the fact that she seemed reasonable and open to compromise was like the polar opposite of a red flag. It was like a blue flag or something. Something that screamed potentially wifey material over here. And as much as I tried not to hype the whole thing up, I was super excited to meet her to see if we had as much chemistry in person. So we arranged a meeting at a local coffee shop, nice and public for a first time meeting. We're talking on Telegram by this point too, so she was able to send me a picture of the outfit she planned on wearing just so I could recognize her. And oh my god, she looked gorgeous. I didn't think I could get any more nervous than I already was, but when I saw her in that flannel shirt with the sleeves rolled so her tats were showing, I swear I felt my blood pressure ramp up by five notches. Anyway, I take a few deep breaths, psych myself up to meet her, then head out of my apartment and around to the coffee place. Anyone who's been on a first date for the first time in a while will tell you how nerve-wracking it can be. Standing there, or sitting there, trying to look cool, while simultaneously being nervous as you're rubbernecking for any sign of your date. So, that's the kind of mood I'm in as I'm standing outside the coffee place, stewing in my own anxiety for 10 minutes, then 15, then 20. By the time I'd been waiting for a half hour, I was starting to get a little worried. Amy had mentioned that traffic was awful, so I figured she might be a few minutes late. But a whole half hour late? I was starting to think I was being stood up. I shoot Amy a text asking how far away she was. It takes a few minutes for her to see the message, but unlike her usual replies, which took a matter of minutes to type out, she doesn't send me anything. I figured that might be because she's driving, so I decide to give her a call just in case it's more convenient for her to talk that way. But again, there's no answer. I'm trying my best not to panic, telling myself like, it's fine, she's just busy, don't freak out. But I think deep down, I knew it was all too good to be true. We'd matched too fast, she'd been too nice, I mean she was objectively way out of my league but it didn't make what came next any easier to deal with. I'm practically staring at our message thread on my phone, praying she'll either call or I'd get that little Amy is typing thing so I can at least know that she's still there. Then thank God. I see that little typing notification, and I feel this pure wave of relief wash over me, expecting her message to say something along the lines of, oh my God, I'm so sorry I'm late. But it didn't say that. It said something entirely different. And although I can't remember exactly what the message said as I didn't exactly keep it around my inbox for long, it said something like this. Okay, I think this has gone on long enough and I have to come clean. I'm not a lesbian. I'm not even a girl. Sorry to catfish you. 
I just thought you were hot and wanted to check you out in person. In person? What did they mean by in person? What followed was the most horrifying moment of revelation that I've ever experienced. Not only was Amy not real, or at least not the person I thought I was talking to, but the psycho creeper who got off on inconveniencing lesbians was actually there, somewhere not too far away, watching me. It made my skin crawl. I was angry, upset, confused, but the feeling that seemed to override all others was fear. The pure terror of being seen by someone or something that you can't see in turn. I start spinning around trying to find the creep staring at me, but no one seemed to be watching, or if they were, they were certainly doing a great job of hiding it. Then, and I'm not even sure what compelled me to do this, but I started looking up. Now the coffee place I was standing outside was surrounded by tall buildings, possibly the reason my instincts were screaming like, up, up, up. I must have looked like I was losing my mind out there, spinning like a top with this terrified look on my face, but suddenly, I saw him. Standing about five stories up in a large open window was the figure of a man. He was so high up that I couldn't quite make out his face, but he was definitely holding something in his hand, and I'd be willing to bet my left arm that it was a freaking cell phone. I'm guessing most of the units were apartments, and they all had those large glass windows, but he was the only person I could see up there. It sure did look like he was staring down at me, but I mean... I didn't know for sure that he was staring at me. And then just when I figured I might just be imagining things and that there was no one actually watching me, just the sick troll that had tricked me into a fake date, he waved. The guy raised his hand and gives this slow, theatrical wave to make it perfectly clear that he was watching me. I swear to God I nearly puked right there and then. I was this horrible combination of nauseous and numb, and I've never felt like I was about to pass out in my entire life, but I feel like I came close right then. My head was just spinning with this like, this can't be happening, how could it be so dumb? No one that hot would ever like me, of course it's a catfish, you're so stupid, 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 stupid. All I could do was just walk away with legs like jelly wondering if I was going to scream or cry first. I've never felt so violated before, not without an actual crime being committed. I had zero recourse other than to report the catfish account, and no matter how upset I was, it wasn't like I could get the cops to arrest anyone over it. So yeah, I walked back to my apartment in a kind of daze, fell onto my mattress and just ugly cried into a pillow for like a half hour straight. It was seriously one of the worst days of my entire life and it put me off dating apps for almost two whole years. Even now, I have to apologize when talking to girls because I know I sound overly paranoid asking for video dates or whatever. I guess I'm lucky. And I can kind of blame COVID but honestly I don't care how paranoid or overly cautious I might seem. After what I went through, I can assure you, you can never be too careful when it comes to meeting internet strangers. After about a year of using the dating app Hinge, I'd pretty much worked through every girl on there. I'm not saying I had much success, but since my preferences were kind of narrow, there weren't all that many potential matches for me. I'd check Hinge every so often to see if there were any new faces, but the vast majority were girls I'd seen before, having deleted their accounts before making new ones, and any actual new faces just didn't seem to do it for me. That's when Coraline appeared in my Discover section. Her name wasn't actually Coraline, but since this story does get kind of personal, I'm going to change some names to protect the innocent. Every so often I'd see a girl on Hinge that'd provoke an audible wow from me. Coraline, or Coral for short, was one of them. At the risk of sounding a little ignorant, when I first saw her, I thought she might be like half Asian or something, but it turned out that she had some indigenous Mexican blood in her, and her grandma was from the native Nahuatl tribe. The point was, she had this unusual but undeniably attractive look about her, and 
With her dip-dyed shoulder-length hair, I found myself instantly captivated. But as I scrolled down, I saw one of her prompts said, You should know, I was in a car accident and I have some neurological disabilities and scarring as a result. That kind of came out of left field for me and I found myself confronted with what I suppose is my own bias. I was so game to ask this girl out, but I honestly hesitated when I read the thing about her disabilities. And I mean, why? She's gorgeous, smart, obviously super active if half her pictures are in climbing and workout gear. And from what I could tell, the fact that she continued to date after an accident like that made her extremely brave from where I'm standing. I'm honestly not sure I'd have the same kind of balls to bounce back after something that nearly killed me. That was what swung it. That and the idea that passing on a girl I'd normally swoon over just because she had some deformities, I think that's a bit of a jerk move on my end, I'm sure you'll agree. So, I sent her a message, and I did what I usually do and just hope for the best. After a few days later, we match, and the fact that I was so elated about it told me how much it actually mattered to me that she had some differences. I was excited to talk to a charismatic, brave, and beautiful young woman whose attitude towards her own adversity was frankly inspiring for me. At first we talked about literature and traveling and by the time she used the word petrichor in a sentence, petrichor is the earthly scent produced when rain falls on dry soil, I was practically throwing my phone number at her. And luckily for me, she was actually keen on continuing the conversation. Texting and voice notes soon progressed to organizing a first date, and we met for coffee and donuts one rainy afternoon, fixing all of the world's problems over the course of like a three-hour conversation. I didn't even try to broach the subject of her accident, I figured that she'd talk about it if or when she was ready. But as she said, she had this policy of fail fast, and if I couldn't deal with her disabilities, there was no point pursuing anything. She showed me some of the scarring in her hairline and some of the scarring on her shoulder too, the accident had left her unable to lift her left arm above her shoulder height, but perhaps the thing that had the biggest impact on her life was the night terrors. Coral mentioned how she'd gotten her panic attacks under control with therapy and medication, but that residual fear seemed to have just confided itself to the nighttime. She said it was one of the biggest things that held her back from getting back to dating after the accident and she'd often worried she'd have an attack of night terrors after being intimate with somebody. I'll be honest, I kind of worried about that too. Not so much because it would freak me out. I totally get why she had nightmares after a major car accident, but she was terrified of embarrassing herself, as she put it. So, I did something entirely against my instincts, and waited like two months to try and seal the deal, so to speak. I waited until I was entirely sure she was comfortable around me, sleeping in the same bed and all that stuff and only then did I invite her back to my place to make the next move. I promise I won't go into any unnecessary detail, but it was wonderful and even with the scarring she hated so much, she was beautiful. And as we fell asleep in each other's arms I started to wonder what was I so worried about in the first place. I wake up in the middle of the night roll over to check my phone and it's about 3 a.m. It's perfectly quiet so Coral hasn't had night terrors or whatever so my first thought is like she's comfy and asleep. Awesome. I roll back to try and spoon Coral a little and find that there's no one there. I figure she's just in the bathroom or whatever. I have an ensuite. But there's no lights on and no noise coming from it. I check the floor next to the side of the bed where she's tossed some of her clothes and they're gone. And only then, in my half-sleep, half-drunken state, do I realize she's bailed while I was asleep. I mean, it hurt. I'd never had a girl get up and leave in the middle of the night like that, but before I even had time to process it, I heard the front door of my apartment rattling. So little side note, I live in this really terrible Brooklyn apartment at the time, one where the door wouldn't stay shut unless you actually locked it from the inside. So, unlike other places, where that kind of sound would indicate someone was outside wanting to get in, I realized that it might well be Coral making noise as she's trying to get out. I didn't think she was having a night terror, or like some kind of episode. 
I have no idea what to make of anything, and I'm still half asleep and incredibly confused. So, it was with a fair amount of nerves and caution that I edged around my bedroom and into the main hallway to see what was going on with that door. And just like I'd deduced in the final moments before I left my bedroom, it was indeed Coral, trying to get out of my apartment, probably confused and scared as to why the door was locked. I was sure that I'd mentioned something about it to her and that my keys lived in a teeny little holder by the door that looked like a little cuckoo clock. You wouldn't know it could open unless someone tells you. But then again, coming back home a little tipsy after our meal might have meant it slipped my mind entirely. Uh, Coral? Are you okay? I asked her. She just span around to face me, and it was only then that I realized that she had a corkscrew in her hand, and she's holding it almost like a pair of brass knuckles, with the screw emerging from between her fingers. Who are you? She screams at me. Why is the door locked? Let me out of here before I call the cops. I realized right then that she was having some kind of episode. She'd had a night terror, forgotten where she was or something, and now she was freaking out. It was scary, sure, but at least I knew what was happening, and after having talked about it a little, I knew exactly what I had to do. C Coraline, it's me. You, you came here after some food, we slept together. You're safe, I promise. I I'm sorry about my door. I have to lock it like that, but you're free to leave if you want to. You just, you need to calm down. But please... I tried to get it all out at once, all while staying calm enough to bring her down from the brink. Open the door before I kill you! Having anyone lunge at you with a corkscrew is intimidating. It really doesn't matter if they're five foot nothing incredibly skinny, but have someone lunge at you with a corkscrew when you're completely naked? That's real fear, let me tell you. Coraline? I started talking really, really slow. I can't open the door without the key. I need to get the key. That's when she approaches even further and pushes the sharp point of the corkscrew into my neck. Not hard enough to actually puncture my throat, but oh my god, one smidgen of force more and I'd have been squirting blood like a Kill Bill henchman. There came a moment when I was sure she was about to plunge that piece of cold steel into my neck. She took this sharp inhale and kind of flexed her arm. I don't know. It's hard to describe. But I remember my heart just pounding in my chest as I'm thinking the next thing I'd be doing would be rushing to call 911. But right as she seems like she's about to stab me with a freaking corkscrew, she relents. And I can see this look enter her eyes as she sort of, and this is the best way I can describe it, wakes up. She sees the corkscrew at my neck and just drops it, recoiling like she was horrified at what she was doing. She looks me dead in the eye and stammers out, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I... And then her speech just degenerated into silent, gasping tears. My heart absolutely broke for her in that moment. The big thing she'd feared about getting back into dating, it had happened and it was probably worse than either of us had imagined it would be. It was dawn by the time she calmed down, and as much as I insisted that she was free to leave, I wanted her to stay. I wanted to be supportive. I hated the idea of making her feel like I was mothering her or whatever, but at the same time, I just wanted to protect her and help her so bad. Not the healthiest inclination when it comes to relationships, but it is what it is, I suppose. I'd like to give you some kind of super happy ending here too, but my relationship with Coral didn't last. She just didn't feel like she was quite ready to date yet, and rushing it had made her feel worse than ever. That sucked to hear. It sucked hard. And as that dumb old cliche goes, if you love something, let it go. I still think about her from time to time, and I hope she's doing much better than she was. And Coral, if by some small possibility you're reading this and you recognize that this is about you. I love you and I forgive you. I ended up matching with this girl on Hinge and don't ask me how, 
but the topic of conversation ended up being piercings. She had a bunch of visible and apparently non-visible piercings, and after I mentioned considering a nose piercing a while ago, we got into it as to why I didn't get one. I was honest. I told her I put it off and put it off because I was scared it'd hurt. But like, the longer I put it off, the less I wanted it, if that makes sense. Until in the end, I just wasn't all that fussed on getting it done. She playfully takes offense to this, calling me a little baby and saying we should go on a piercing date together. I told her we should probably wait until at least the third date to go full daddy dom. A joke, obviously, and the conversation then kind of meandered into other topics. Cut to our first date. Everything going pretty good. We get beer and wings. We're getting on well. And then she says she has a surprise for me. I'm pretty stoked at the idea. I couldn't possibly guess what it was, but if she'd brought me a gift or like thought of somewhere cool to take me, I thought that was pretty thoughtful. Anyway, I ask what it is and she says she can't show me in the wings place. I have to wait until we get outside. Kind of mysterious, right? And that only makes the anticipation build and build until the time we finally do get outside. And I'm incredibly excited to see what she's got in store for me. So like I said, she had a lot of piercings. And was kind of like a punk chick in general. So there's a little context for the fact that she had this cut off denim jacket on. With like three or four safety pins running through one of the collars. She takes one of the safety pins, unfastens it, and before I could even ask her what she was thinking, she rams the sharp of it through both, I repeat, both, of her nostrils. See? Doesn't hurt at all. She said, as all this blood starts trickling out of her nostrils and down onto her lips. Now you've got no excuse not to. No matter how much I insisted, this girl was determined to pierce at least one of my nostrils, and went from like a playful haha no thanks, to me physically resisting her and eventually telling her to get off of me. As you can imagine, this caused quite a scene, as she legit looked like she's been punched in the mouth, and now we're having a full on shouting match. Right about the time she screams, what's your problem? I realize there's an actual crowd gathering and a lot of this crowd seems to think that the girl's mouth is bloody because I hit her. Now let me make it clear, even when I'm trying to keep this girl from shoving a piece of metal in my face, I didn't get physical with her at all. The most I did was grab her wrist and keep it away from me because even if she was only joking around, all it would take after a few beers would be a slip or a trip, or why am I even justifying this? Don't put pieces of a sharp metal near the other people's faces and expect a good reaction. But anyway, this little crowd started forming and most people are concerned with the girl if she needed 911 calling for her mouth, helpful stuff, not accusation stuff. But on the other hand, there's a few dudes circling me like, did you just lay hands on her bruh? Think you're tough hitting on a lady like that, mf -er, all that kind of stuff. I obviously fire back by telling them it's none of their business, but as soon as the words leave my lips, I realize that, although it wasn't any of their business, and it wasn't what they thought it was, if anything, mind your own business just confirm that I was some woman beating POS. But the worst thing, when it became obvious what I was being accused of, the girl had been so offended by my piercing rejection that she did absolutely nothing to reassure anyone that I hadn't hit her. The last thing I did before I had to just flee the entire scene was look over to her like, Really? You're like this? And it turns out, she was. Because what else would you want to call a girl who turns a perfectly nice date into a potential lynching in the space of about 10 minutes? If those dudes had caught up to me, or if they weren't so drunk or hadn't been as athletic as I was at the time, I'd probably have had my head bashed in on the sidewalk and there's a decent chance I wouldn't have the brain function to even be writing this. So please, be careful with the kind of people you're meeting up with on dating apps. I think one of the coolest things promoted with them is the whole video date thing that's introduced during this whole pandemic thing. I mean, not so much because they're corona compliant or whatever, more because I feel like you get a much better idea of someone's personality that way. And if I'd had done that with Piercer Girl, 
and got a hint of how intense she was, I might not have been so quick to take her out. And taking her out not only led to the single worst date I've ever been on, but also one of the scariest nights of my entire life. I went on a date with a hinge guy once, who right in the middle of it said he had to stop off at his apartment because he forgot his wallet. This is as we're inexplicably moving from one coffee shop to another, one that just so happened to be on the same route as his apartment. He asked me if I want to come inside just in case he's searching for a while and since he's been perfectly nice and non-threatening so far, I didn't see any reason not to. Then right as we get into his TV room, he ends up pulling me down onto his beanbag and trying to make out with me. He didn't do it in a super aggressive way, so much as he was like, trying to be sexy. It was not. When I called him out on it, he said he was just messing around, but I was so turned off at that point that I ended up just getting up and walking home a few minutes later. He texted me a few times, trying to apologize and assure me that it was a joke, but I don't know. It was so cringy that I just couldn't get past it. Fast forward to a year later and I read on the local news site that he was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping and assault of a woman. After the woman that he had been on a date with complained to the police that he'd held her up against her will. Apparently when she tried to leave, he held her captive in his apartment and beat her and assaulted her. He could have faced life in prison, but after just six years in prison he might actually get out this year if parole goes well. Six years... He should be in prison for the rest of his life, and sometimes I wonder how close I came to being the one tied up in his basement. I met this guy on Hinge, swapped numbers, texted a lot, and thought, why not go on a date? Well, there were a lot of things he failed to mention, such as his extreme Tourette's. Every sentence had a swear word thrown in randomly and he would interrupt me constantly while I brushed aside because I have met a lot of people with the syndrome before. His height was almost a foot less than his profile said. Said he was just over six foot, but I'm 5'7 and towered over him. And of course, forgot to mention the six other girls he was in a relationship with. I was uneasy initially because of how much he failed to mention, but it got worse. He took me to a massive antique store, we both love old stuff, which was basically the creepiest warehouse I'd been in. It was dimly lit with all sorts of creepy dolls lining the walls, not my kind of antique store. So we're walking through it with him randomly shouting swear words and I just want to go home. He kept grabbing my shoulder, cupping the shoulder and squeezing hard, then would run his hand down my back and grabbing my butt. I tell him I'm not comfortable with that. And he grabs my hand and pulls me into the bathroom at the end of the shop, throws me against the wall so I end up on my hands and knees. I'm kind of in shock now. Locks the door, lowers his pants and thrusts his junk into my face. When I didn't follow his request, he grabbed my jaw and even tried opening my mouth. A finger slips in and I take the opportunity to bite. This freaked him out, screaming, what's wrong with you? And I stand up slap him across the face and get out as soon as possible. I'm crying while running out of the shop and the shopkeeper stops me and asks what's wrong. I explain what just happened and he looked over to see my date chasing after me. Thank the lord he was arrested on sight and I haven't heard from him since. Thankfully I'm now with a wonderful man so even in all the trauma I suppose some things do work out in the end. I love telling the story. I mean, it's creepy, but it's kind of morbidly fascinating too. Some seriously crazy people really do walk among us. So first thing you need to know is I get migraines with aura. I generally vomit from pain from them. It's like hard to see sometimes because Light sources have big halos and everything like glows, it's all unpleasant. About two years ago, I'm excitedly getting ready for a hinge date and I start feeling a migraine coming. It's like 45 minutes from the time we set. 
This dude's been super pleasant over chat. He has this cute hipster Buddy Holly look going on, and I swear if anybody ever told me, sorry I have a headache less than an hour before our first date, I'd delete their number. So obviously I have to go. Sometimes I can ward off my migraines with caffeine and we're going to a Thai place so I rush through finishing dressing for the date and head to the restaurant because I've decided that the solution is to get there early, drink a Thai iced coffee to load up on caffeine and get this migraine gone before he shows up. It doesn't work. Dude shows up. I keep casually like propping my head up on my hand while we talk so I can press against my temple with my fingers. I'm only making one word responses and positive noises that is my entire part of the conversation. At two separate points I leave the table and go puke in the restaurant's bathroom and then come back pretending like nothing happened. I would like to say I'm just an amazing actress but I'm not. I get called out instantly when I show up to work hungover. Also, let me reiterate I was not speaking in complete sentences this entire dinner, so this guy was like on a date with a corpse. He was so into me. He kissed me outside the restaurant and I pulled away pretending shyness. I had puke in my mouth. Gave him some line about it being pleasant and went home to die. The dude spent three weeks straight trying to get me to go out with him again. He was so into this corpse woman he went on a date with. I shared no thoughts, no personal anecdotes. I did nothing the whole date but nod weekly. And he was really into that. I am, when not physically impaired, what one would call abroad in the positive sense. I curse and talk a ton of crap and don't take anything from anyone and have thought about everything in the world. This dude would hate my actual self, and to be honest, I think the fact that he apparently wanted to date someone with no opinions of their own is probably why he's single. After matching with this art student girl on Hinge, we hit it off and organized a first date. Definitely wasn't the greatest I'd ever been on, but it wasn't bad either. And although I was down to see her again, I didn't think that she'd text me again. But then the very next night, she texted me saying that she just so happened to be at a bar in my neighborhood and asked if I wanted to hook up or something. Why not? I thought I could roll up, get a few drinks, maybe get her back to my place. It could make for a great night. And at first, I was so glad I went down. We had considerably more chemistry than the night before. She seemed open and chatty and really flirty, and I just figured maybe she'd like opened up or something. Maybe talked it out with a friend and decided, yeah, I think I do like that guy. I'm serious too. We really did have a great time. None of the social awkwardness or shyness, just pure chemistry. And then right around closing time, she hits me with a, I think we should go back to your place, and gave me this look that made me blush so hard I could literally feel it. I had no idea what I was doing right, but having decided not to overthink it, I just got us an Uber and got us back to my place. The whole cab ride back, it's the same deal. We're kind of drunk, but we both have it together. The Uber driver has some song on that she likes. She asks him to turn it up. He does, and she starts belting out whatever the lyrics are. Kind of rowdy, sure, but still good vibes. But when just as we pull up to my apartment, each of us thanks the driver, and then just remember watching as she opens up her door, then just sort of leans out face first and wipes out in the concrete. I thought she might have been seriously injured at first, but thank God it was just a little swelling around her forehead. But still... I got her into my apartment with a bag of frozen peas on her head. Only she can barely speak at that point, and I'm not even sure if it was the alcohol or the hit she took falling out of the cab. So, I'm like juggling, getting her glasses of water, icing her forehead, and praying it's not so serious that we have to call 911 or something. But over the next course of time, I don't even know how long, but my anxiety just rises and rises as her conditions get worse and worse. It got to the point that she could barely speak, but she's just assuring me like, got a nap, just need a nap and I'm good. So I show her into my bedroom, let her collapse onto the bed, make sure she won't swallow her puke if she just so happens to do, and then I pretty much leave her to it. 
I wasn't about to be a total creep and do anything weird. I just gave her the space she needed and hoped she wouldn't puke. It slowly dawns on me that she's most definitely not just going to take a nap. When I open up my bedroom door to check on her and she's snoring like a bear. By that point, I'm actually pretty sleepy myself, but again, in a bid not to come off like a total creep, I decided not to share the bed with her. I grab her my running flask full of water, almost impossible to spill, put my small office trash can by the bed, just in case she needs to hurl, and then I get comfy on the couch that's just become my bed for the night. I honestly can't remember if I drifted off to sleep or not, but the next thing I know, I'm staring at the ceiling hearing some seriously weird noises from my bedroom. I get up, walk into the hall, then push the bedroom door open to check on my date, and this is what I see. She's kind of groaning, holding her head in her hands, and I clearly hear her need to pee in the middle of what sounded like a long, uncomfortable groan. She rolls onto her side like she's about to climb off my bed, but instead of actually pulling it off, she screws up completely, rolls off the bed entirely, and knocks the trash can over as she falls to the floor with a thud. Then I swear to God, she just reaches for her drawers, pulling them down and starts like peeing up like a freaking fountain. I had no idea girls could even do that, and I'd have been impressed if it wasn't my carpet she was peeing all over. As squeamish as I was about getting the girls pee all over me, I managed to get her up before I walk her to the bathroom, sit her down on the toilet. She makes a few more grunts, then starts going again, so I take the opportunity to clean up my carpet a little. Then as I'm soaking up the pee into a dish towel and wringing it out into a bowl of soapy water, I just hear, dud, against the wall, sounding an awful lot like my date just fell off the effing toilet. At this point, she is completely immobile, and I can't get her up, almost like she just got 50 pounds heavier in the space of about 5 minutes. So... I grab a pillow, prop her head against it, and resolve to sleep in the bathroom with her just in case A, anything else happened, or B, my sketchy roommate came home and did anything weird. That's another scary story entirely, by the way. After a few hours of rough sleep, she wakes me up and tells me she needs to use the bathroom. I leave so she can do her thing in peace. But after maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I start worrying again, so I go to knock on the door only to find it unlocked and slightly ajar. I push it open, only to be confronted with one of the most obscene stenches I'd ever been faced with in my life. Not only did this adorable young woman produce one of the most heinous stenches in the history of smells, but she had somehow managed to poop absolutely everywhere, except in the actual toilet bowl. Like to this day, I have no idea how she did it, but I couldn't seem to get the smell out of my bathroom for weeks afterwards. On top of that, the way she'd fallen had somehow gotten her head almost jammed between the toilet and the sink, and for a while I wasn't sure I'd be able to get her out without seriously hurting her neck. I managed to get her head free, but she is completely out for the count by that point, and there was nothing more I could do for her other than just allow her to get some rest. I can't get her up, and I just can't face the prospect of wiping her butt for her, So I just leave her in the bathroom with some water and some towels and head back to the couch in hopes of getting a few hours of sleep before work. Oh yeah, I had work the next morning. After a few hours, I hear her get up and go to my bed. I check in on her and she is out, fully clothed, in my bed and covered in puke still. Feeling utterly disgusted and defeated, I go back to the couch. When I get up for work, I go to check on her at around 7 a.m., Again, she's snoring like a bear, so I just leave her a $10 bill, a set of clean clothes that are roughly her size, and directions to the nearest laundromat. Although, if I was her, I'd have just tossed my dirty clothes in a dumpster and forgot all about them. I figured I'd done her a huge favor. I get that it wasn't her fault, but she had completely screwed up my bathroom and made a complete mess of my bedroom, too. I really did think that was the worst it was going to get, and it wasn't like I was expecting a groveling apology either. I mean, maybe a thank you wouldn't have gone amiss. But what came next, I don't think I ever could have guessed, not in a million years. I get a text from her that day, just after I get home from work. I expected to say thank you, maybe trying to piece together what happened that night, but instead, 
The message basically says this. I know it was you. I'm going to the cops. I hope you get everything you deserve in prison. It seems so out of place. For that second, I thought it was a joke or in bad taste or a text to the wrong person or something. I reply with, excuse me? And she follows up with, and I'm paraphrasing but this is the gist, you put something in my drink. I'm getting my hair tested. Expect a visit from the cops, you scumbag. Apparently the only way to test for that drug is through the hair. It's expensive, inaccurate, which terrified me, but it's the only way to do it. And it all clicked. She thought I'd spiked her, because we ended up at my apartment. That was her conclusion, that it must have been me who tried to violate her. And that was the single most eye-wateringly scary moments of my entire life, realizing I'd been accused of something like that. And from where I was standing, there was no reason to think that it wasn't me. Like, think about it. You hear about a girl getting spiked and she just happens to end up back at some guy's apartment who she met on Hinge. I mean, Jesus. I might think I was guilty too. I didn't text her back. I figured any text might be used as evidence or whatever, and I mean, what do you even say when you're accused of something like that aside from all the obvious stuff? She'd obviously made up her mind already. The only person worth contacting might well be a lawyer at that point. Then boom. The day came when my phone rang, and it was a cop asking if he could stop by and talk to me at home. I mean, he actually gave me the don't leave town line as we were hanging up. I was a full-on suspect in something that made me feel physically sick to think about, as horrifying as it was surreal, and I was just going to have to deal with it. What follows is like six weeks worth of boring police procedure, and in that time, I had a full-on nervous breakdown. Again, another story entirely. But here's the skinny on the accusation. My date couldn't actually remember which bar we'd been to, but I could. And once the cops knew where we'd been drinking, they were able to check the CCTV cameras they had, which just so happened to catch a guy hanging around there who was actually on the offender's registry. Not only does this guy approach my date and her drink while I'm in the bathroom, but after we leave, he hangs around looking all over for someone, presumably my date. The cops go pay him a visit and find a ton of GHB and other creepy creeper stuff in his apartment, along with trophies he'd kept from a bunch of other girls. It looked like none of the DNA was going to come back as a match for any on the police database, and then boom. Something like the final pair of underwear they test comes back a match. The guy gets arrested, and they have an airtight case against him, and he goes to jail. And then that was that. No apology from the police, no apology from the girl. I blame that whole thing for me beginning to lose my hair early, and I didn't get so much as a cent in compensation. I suppose I should count myself lucky that the justice system didn't screw me over or anything, but still... I wouldn't wish that kind of accusation on my worst enemy. So I had been out of the dating game for roughly a year, and being the awkward mess that I am, my best friend had convinced me to try out Hinge. Figured, eh, I can get to know people online and then try a date. Terrible idea. I'm still mad at her. So I meet this guy on the site and we spend a few weeks chatting and getting to know each other and he seems really cool. He asked me on a date and I said sure. And here's the part where I'm a moron and am surprised I didn't get murdered. I say I prefer low-key dates so he suggests that he cook us dinner and we watch indie horror films at his place. I agree. And I'm so stupid for this. I show up to his place and have developed a code word system through text with my bestie and she has all the details of where I am. He meets me outside and I realize I tower over him. At 5 foot 7, that rarely happens to me, but I shrug it off. Can't help your height, right? We go up to his place and he shows me around, emphasizing on the bedroom. Then takes me to the kitchen to show me the four bottles of very expensive wine he bought for me. And no dinner prepared. He pours me a glass and I awkwardly pet his dog. We sit on the couch and he puts on this weird Italian art film. No subtitles, and all Italian. Neither of us know what is happening. So I just sit there, 
feet flat on the ground, spine rod-shaped, sipping my wine when he decides to basically curl up in my lap. And he starts nuzzling my face, like that thing cats do, but with his face on my face for at least ten straight minutes. His dog looks at me with pity. At this point, I excuse myself to the bathroom and text the bestie to call me and get me out of there. After taking her call 20 minutes later, I politely try and thank him for the glass of wine and make my way off the couch and he lays across me and force cuddles me. Wouldn't let me leave, so I just stood up and he plummets to the floor. Because like I said, I'm an Amazonian compared to him. He pops up off the floor to help me put my coat on and he gives me one good sniff right at the nape of my neck. Pretty sure some of my hair is still infused to his brain from how deep an inhale that was. I made no attempt to hide my running down the three flights of stairs and up the block to my car. Deleted my account that night. Please, never again. Almost two years ago now, I went on a date with a famous chef I met on Hinge where I was taken to a dive bar where he promptly started talking about how famous he was. We drank and watched sports. He proceeds to tell me, you're cute. And this eventually went to, I'm going to make you bleed. He then invited one of his friends to come along. I went outside and he came up to kiss me. I was drunk, so I kissed back. Eventually he proceeded to tell me how he was being charged with battering his ex-girlfriend, but he totally didn't do it. Eventually, when it came time to pay the bill, he lost his wallet. Of course, I get stuck with it. I'll pay you back, he says. Needless to say, I never got that payment. Then he leaned up against me. I thought he was trying to kiss me, but I looked down and he was actually peeing on me. In the street, peeing directly on me. I swiftly, being too inebriated to drive, went and got myself a hotel room and a hot shower. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm Eastern Standard Time. If you get a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream on random Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.